Hey, it's Mark. I'm back again with another awesome episode of Finding Your Summit. And this week, I've got former NFLer Pete Koch on the pod. And Pete is a guy that we share a, a lot in common. Number one, uh, we're both NFL players. Um, I was drafted in the seventh round. He was drafted in the first out of Maryland. We actually met each other, even though we didn't know it. Back in the day when Washington played Maryland in the first inaugural uh, Aloha Bowl. So it was pretty cool. We actually won, <laughs> which was nice to rib him about uh, a little bit in the final seconds. We go through that and then uh, life after football for him. Uh, after the Raiders, which we share that common bond, he entered into the world of acting and doing some modeling stuff. And now he's a public speaker and uh, he trains people. The guy is built like a brick house and he trains people for those who want to know out in uh, Santa Monica, California and in that uh, greater area. So uh, just a fun pod. The guy is a good dude and he's got lots of life uh, behind him and uh, great things ahead. And so we go through that journey with him. And as always, remember, this pod is brought to you by Violet, VioletsAreBlueSkinCare.com from Cynthia Besteman. She is a uh, survivor herself of cancer. She overcame, found her way, and then started this all-natural skincare line. And as always, if anybody wants to find out about my journey, they can at www markpattisonnfl.com and you can find out about my climbs. I've got an e-learning course coming out called Finding Your Summit. Things like that. Okay, so on that note, let's go Dr. Pete. Here we go. Hey everybody, it's Mark Pattison back again with another fantastic episode of Finding Your Summit. Of course, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. And this guy I'm totally fired up about on the pod because we're going to talk a lot of football. We're going to talk a lot about fitness and wellness and health and all that stuff. There are so many different common bonds that we share. Uh, and this guy is Pete Koch. Peach, how are you doing? Good morning. It's good to be with you. Thanks. Yeah. So I'm beaming all the way from Sun Valley. I think you're in LA someplace, right? Yeah, Santa Monica. Santa Monica, which is a great spot. I just actually moved from Hermosa Beach uh, all the way out here, loving the mountains, but I also love the beach. So you're in a wonderful spot. Yeah, thanks. I've been here. Um, you know, I, I ended up in, in Los Angeles when I finished my playing career with the, at that time, the Los Angeles Raiders, and I just stayed. Yeah, well, you know, interesting enough. So we have a lot of connections, and you're, some of these things are going to blow your mind. But uh, let's start back just a little bit, and ultimately these paths are going to weave. We'll we'll go through that. But first of all, you you played, you grew up on the East Coast, and you played at the University of Maryland, correct? Yeah, that's right. I'm from Long Island originally, and uh, went to school, University of Maryland. I was uh, had a, had a great experience there, and just you know, sort of to give people a historical perspective. I uh, finished the same year as Boomer Esiason. We had a good team at that point. We were the we won the ACC championship. I was the, I was the captain of that football team, and Boomer was providing a lot of offense. And then we had a pretty stingy defense on top of that. And we had a heck of a head coach and a guy named Bobby Ross, who later went on to uh, Georgia Tech, won a national championship there, and then he went to the Chargers took them to their only Super Bowl appearance in the 90s and then finished with the Detroit Lions. So he had a heck of a – he was a heck of a football coach, and uh, I had a great time there. I don't want to bring up any painful memories for you. Certainly, uh, I'm sure a lot of this has been about you trying to overcome this particular adversity, but uh, I did play in the University of Washington. Uh, we were oh. the Huskies. We did end up in the Aloha Bowl. We did play Boomer and probably you. And yes. I believe we beat you in the last second on a field goal. <laughs> That's, you know what? I if, if, uh, we could Google this. I, my recollection was, and yeah, I, I I played in that game, and that was the very first. That was the inaugural Aloha Bowl. That's right. And I believe the final score was twenty-one twenty. Uh, we it was a it was a missed PAT, and we it was either missed or blocked. Might have been blocked, and we had. Uh, one of the best field goal kickers in the nation named Jesse Atkinson. Yep. And he was flawless with these field goals. And I cannot remember, but it, I, I'm pretty sure it was, it was the missed PAT that, that was the difference in the game. And it was heartbreaking. 
And that was quite a, it was, it was just a great matchup. It was, it was a great way to start. I think that, that, uh, Aloha bowl by, uh, by matching these two teams from opposite coasts. And man, I didn't know anything in the world about the Washington Huskies. And, um, but it turned out to be, uh, it was a great game. Yeah. You got us. (laughs) Yeah. No, no, that was a, that was a great memory. I mean, like you said, it was the first inaugural, uh, uh, Aloha Bowl. We had just been knocked off by. Um, we were in a position to go to the Rose Bowl again. That would have been my third year. We got knocked out by Washington State, and then that led us into that first bowl game. And so I had been to Hawaii on a recruiting trip, uh, my only time. So that was my second time there, and uh, we just had a blast, like you guys, you know, just running up and down Oahu and having a ton of of fun and the sun and and doing all those things and. And I didn't realize, you know, the magnitude of what Boomer and your team brought to the table. Of course, we're on the West Coast. You guys are on the East Coast. And so a lot of the times, you know, so many of those, the the coverage and everything else is so much more concentrated on the East versus the West. And so I think we were both surprised at the talent level on both sides of the ball. And uh, there was a, there was a uh, great player for Washington. Uh, actually, Tim Cowan was our quarterback, and he threw a mm-hmm. last-second touchdown to to Anthony Allen, he scored. We were now tied, and then our our record holding place kicker uh, Chuck Nelson came in and kicked the extra point, and yeah. that sealed the game. and And the thing I, I remember more than anything was is we had dressed for some reason at the hotel. We were staying at the Sheraton right there on Waikiki, and after the game, we 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 jumped in all the, these different buses, and and we you know we still have our pads on and everything, and. And we, we come charging back to the, the hotel and our, one of our assistant coaches, Al Roberts, actually takes this out to the, to the pool. He said, nobody go inside the hotel. Everybody follow me. So there's this big, long line of football players. And we go and we surround the pool. On the count of three, we all jumped in with our pads on. It was awesome. Wow. Yeah. It was awesome. Uh, and they got some great uh, pictures and maybe some video, I hope. Of, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Well, back then, you know, it was a little bit different because people didn't have iPhones, as you know. And, and so it wasn't – I don't know if there's any pictures. It was so spontaneous, you know. It was just like, huh. boom, let's go make this thing happen. I mean, we were jumping with joy. It was an exciting game. It was Christmas. You know, what a better way to have a, a great Christmas present than, than that. But, you know, it was just, look, at the end of the day, we were both good teams. And Boomer went on to have a great career. And you also had a, a damn good career. We actually, our careers are very similar with the one exception is, and that is that you were a number one draft pick uh, by the Cincinnati Bengals. I was a seventh round draft pick by the Raiders. So we'll get into that about my Raider and our, your Raider days here in a second. But what was that like for you to be drafted? Number one, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, that's, that's yeah. such, such a huge compliment. Yeah, the initial reaction to, uh, and by the way, it, it was sort of weird. Like, uh, so people would, everybody was watching the draft on ESPN back then, just no different than they do now, except it's obviously a much bigger production. But at that time, oddly enough, I wasn't able to watch the draft and had to listen to it on the radio and sit by the phone. Reason being, the University of Maryland had not wired its campus for cable TV and lived in a dorm. (laughs) So uh, that was a little bit strange. So I didn't watch the draft, didn't see it. I never even saw the footage until like years later. And then, um, then, but I did get a phone call and we were sort of following this along. I was sitting there with some teammates and I got a call and and as you as you know, Mark, you, you know probably had less of the uh, coverage that I had because I was I was it was projected that I was going to be a first round pick yeah. and have all these publications, paper publications, right? So uh, Sports Illustrated and Sport Magazine and, and USA Today and every single magazine is is uh, was a big deal to pro- project the first uh, the positioning of the way the plays would be picked in the first round. And it was speculation that I might be the, uh, I think it was uh, picked by the Green Bay Packers, which had, they had a first, uh, I think, a, I think they picked at 12 and the Jets picked at uh, number 15. The, the Rams had a high pick and the Detroit Lions picked around 20. So the, all those were, were possible and it was all this great speculation. I realize they're just selling magazines, but at the end of the day, I was drafted by the Bengals. I had had one I had a visit from the Bengals defensive line coach who did come to Maryland, and he said to me, 
And uh, I'll just give you a real quick background on this. The Bengals going into the draft had the number one overall pick. And the and then they, of course, had a second round pick. And this coach who met with me says, I don't look, I'm just I just want to say hi to you. I don't think we're not going to draft you because we're not the number one pick. And that's what we got. And then we'd like to see you and we'd like to pick you. Well, I'll tell you, we'll probably pick you in the second round, but you won't be around. You won't you won't be left on the board. And that was it. So what happened was the day before the draft, the. Bengals traded away their number one pick. It was actually a three-way trade, but the way it played out was the, the Bengals gave up their number one pick and went to the New England Patriots. They took Irving Fryer, yep. the receiver out of Nebraska. Nebraska, sure. The Bengals ended up with the pick, three first-round picks, 11, 16, and I think 22. And with the 11th pick, they uh, they took Ricky Hundley, the linebacker out of Arizona, who's yep. a buddy of mine now. And I played with years later with the Raiders. At 16, they took me. And 20, took, they took an offensive tackle named Brian Blados out of North Carolina. And, and this all happened very quickly. And it wasn't exactly something that I was just really following. And again, I couldn't even see the draft on TV. And I get a phone call. Uh, from the Bengals saying they picked me and I didn't have a good feeling about it. And I didn't know much about Cincinnati. It just really caught me off guard. It caught everybody off guard. And I can, t I'll tell you a little, and I'll wrap this up with a backstory. I got to the Bengals and they had two very, very fine uh, pro bowl defensive ends, uh, Eddie Edwards and Ross Browner. And for where I was supposed to fit in there exactly, I, I have no idea. And to this day, I don't think I don't think they knew what they were doing. I was not a good fit. I was not a good pick for them. I was not. They were extremely difficult organization to negotiate with. I held out of uh, back then. Almost everybody held the first round picks. Most of them uh, didn't go into training camp on time. Neither did I. And it wasn't it was I wasn't asking for something outrageous. I had an agent who says we just want to get paid like slotted, like what you're supposed to get paid. They weren't having it. Uh, had a miserable experience that entire year. And then I was cut in training camp the next year. It was, uh, was not, it was exciting. Uh, was also, it felt wrong. I've, I'm, I'm a very instinctual person and I, my instinct was right. Boomer was picked, of course, about an hour later in the beginning of the second round. And we ended up being uh, roommates when we got to Cincinnati. It was a perfect situation for Boomer. It, you couldn't have Hollywood scripted it any better. Kenny Anderson, the Bengals starting quarterback for about 14 years, had about exactly not only did he have about one year left in his body, he was ready to retire. Yeah. And he just helped and mentored Boomer. He was generous. He's a great guy. And it, I knew it was going to be great for Boomer. And I saw it. And he also had a great offensive line. They were ready. They were built for Boomer. And then they had Chris Collinsworth. So they were built for him uh, uh, and they were prepared. Years of, later, I reconnected with Ricky Hunley, who, who's gone on to be an NFL, a longtime NFL assistant coach. He coached, was an assistant coach for, I believe, seven years, going back about six, eight years with Marvin Lewis. Uh, with the, He was a, a, Ricky Hunley, again, was a positional defensive coach with Cincinnati. And we got talking about, by the way, Ricky was the number 11 pick and they never, ever signed him. Eight games into the season, they traded the rights to him to the Denver Broncos who signed him. And he played there and became a starting linebacker there for five years. Very similar to me going on and being a starting defensive end in, with the Kansas City Chiefs uh, later on. And I said, how is it that you and I both had such a fiasco, uh, such a disastrous experience in that 84 draft with the Cincinnati Bengals. And, 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 and again, Ricky ended up working for that organization for eight years. And he goes, they were unprepared. They were unprepared. They, they moved out of the first pick. They got these other draft choices and they choked. They, 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 got, they got it together and they, and they made a great pick in the second round. Boomer fell precipitously, uh, not based on anything talent-wise, but based on uh, fears of his of his attitude, the, the, the Bengals took, you might say, a, small, a little bit of a chance on that. And it was a big score because Boomer was growing up and had this enormous physical skill. Well, look, I, I always think of it. Look, I, I was very blessed to go through the same thing. I was a year later after you. So I was in the 85 draft. Right. 
And okay. from my position or my perspective, I happened to come out in the year of the wide receiver. So it wasn't the best time for me to come. It was the same draft mm-hmm. that uh, Jerry Rice came out in. And I mm-hmm. always said to myself, expect the worst, hope for the best, right? And so I think what people who haven't gone through that experience don't understand is that it's just literally Russian roulette. You are sitting back and you can go in one of 32 different cities, right, which represent these different teams. And so you have no idea if it's going to be a good fit, a bad fit, which city, it's a good city, a bad city. It's cold, it's warm, it's in between. And I just happened to get the lucky card to go down to the uh, L.A. Raiders, right, obviously in Los Angeles. And, um, you know, I found myself in in Manhattan Beach. And, you know, it's just like, seriously, and all these great players, I was I had the good fortune of being next to and play with. And and just uh, they'd come off a Super Bowl a couple years before. And I also played in, in Cincinnati. And it's just a place that, you know, I mean, growing up from, from uh, Seattle in the state of Washington, it's just like, man, I don't know if I could live here. And like you said, it's all about fit. But at the same time, and, and, and I, and I, I want to emphasize this point, um, the name of this podcast is about overcoming adversity. And at the end of the day, it's all relative to each person. And everybody's, you know, adversity is different or can be different. And in your case, it's not fun to be a number one draft pick and then have all the pundits come back and, and, you know, say whatever they said. And then you find yourself up, you know, cut, you know, the next year. And, and at that point, are you a bust or you're not? It's just really circumstantial. And the, and the bottom line is you just need to find that right fit and that right coach and the right support system, which it sounds like you did in Kansas City. Yeah, that's exactly right. I did I did find the right place. It was a, a a route that I couldn't have anticipated that I would make it to and find a home in the in the National Football League, but I did. And it and I knew I was off to a good start when I got off the when I got off the plane in Kansas City and that was so I was I was released in training camp by Cincinnati but claimed on waivers so just 24 hours later I'm on a plane flying to Kansas City and when I and the uh, the the assistant that picked me up at the airport he drove he says what I'm going to do pick me up at the airport which is about 40 minutes outside of sort of outside of town. The the airport there in, Can- in Kansas City is way outside of town. But he says, I'm going to it was about eight o'clock at night. And he says, I'm going to drive you, you. I've been asked to drive you straight over to Arrowhead Stadium. So we're going to take you there and then I'll take you to the hotel and then you'll start practice tomorrow. And so I, I went and I said, well, I thought, well, I wonder why they're doing it this way. Why not just take me to the hotel? So we, I, we get over to Arrowhead Stadium. Uh, I walk in the, the the door. So the, the chief's practice facility is built right into the stadium. It's all you know, self-contained there. It's, it's a beautiful setup. And and who was there? And everybody was gone. It was late at night. M- might have been 9 o'clock at night. Everybody was gone. The guy that was to be my defensive line coach, my positional coach, Walt Corey, a former player himself with the Chiefs. Uh, stay, I don't, he might have stayed an extra hour and a half, two hours just to say, he got, just, he goes, I just wanted to be the first person to extend their hand and, and welcome you to the organization. I, I know things didn't go your way in Cincinnati, but we believe in you here and we believe that we can get this thing back on the rails and you can really help us out. And what a stark contrast that singular experience was for me relative to all that I went through in, in Cincinnati. And it, it made me feel so good. I could just, to this day, Walt Corey, I could just, I could just hug you for doing that. And I learned how a mature man and a grown coach and a leader of men responds in a situation like that, how he handles himself in a situation like that. And that was just the beginning of my relationship with not only Walt Corey, but with the organization in general that was operating at a very uh, much of a higher level. And I knew I had an inkling then and I come to learn very, very quickly that this was an enormous blessing that I would finish, that I would that would I would get cut. That getting cut was uh, the best thing that could have possibly happened to me, and 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 uh, um, forever grateful that uh, it was it was a painful year and, uh, and and a few months experience with the Bengals, but at the end of the day, when they let me, what one in about thirty six hours from the darkest days to the the brightest day when I realized that I had a real home in Kansas City and it was all it was all two years uh, the, the first game I played 
Five days later was the opening day of my second season in the NFL. And Walt says, we might use you a little. I didn't even know the, the much different defense. I didn't even know all the language of the defense. So we might use you a little bit. Be ready. We're going to use you on short, short down and goal line. But we, I might use you if the guys get gassed, you know, maybe to I might insert you a little bit into the game. He did. I played about 14 plays and I had two sacks. And 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 it was a good way to start. It was yeah. good for me. It was good for them. It was all all the indicator lights were moving up. That's great. You know, I, I think it uh, I want to go back to something that you said because I think it swings both ways. I think number one, when you go through adversity and, and now you find yourself in a very positive you talked about you know leader of men Walt Corey he was out there to greet you he stayed extra uh, that night to to welcome you to the facility to the team you know really make you feel warm and fuzzy and, and on the flip side of that I think you know when you exit when you go through your stuff it's all about having the right kind of attitude and perspective and not getting down and, and bad mouthing and, and all those things and and that only serves you best you know moving forward and in this case there's no question it did you had two kind of forces coming together. You had like renewed opportunity, and on, on their side, like I'm not, we're not giving up on this guy. We've we've seen his talent, and we know we can nourish it and and, and make it, it grow and amplify it. And and sure enough, there you go. Your first game, you're out there. You don't think you're going to play that much, and then you're in there for for a couple plays, and you get a couple sacks, and and it's just like a big bang to a new start. And I'm sure you just felt completely rejuvenated. Yeah, that's that's an accurate recap. That's how it went for me. And then, of course, I settled into more of a, a, a normal rhythm of my experience. When the head, when I, when the head coach was John Makovic in, in the, the, the morning of my very first practice, he said to me, Pete, I'm going to uh, sort of guarantee you th- exactly this much and not a bit more. Um, you're going to be a part of this organization and this team for two weeks. That's your tr- that's what I'm guaranteeing you. So don't, you got that after beyond that, you got to earn it. Right. So um, and I actually love that approach to it. It was it was it was measured. And t- by the way, in two weeks is enough to know how exactly I'm going to uh, they're going to they're going to judge how I respond as a professional on a practice field and at how I'm able to gain to uh, to to, to um, handle the situations in limited play during the games. Two weeks is is a fair way to approach that. I thought it was really smart and measured. And I said, I, that's all I asked for. That's and I, I thank you for that much. And I'll come through for you. I, I, I'll give it my very, very best. And, um, and and then beyond that, you know, he and John Makovic did even respond, uh, you know, within about a week and a half later. And he goes, you know, we're really happy to have you here. And this is this is going to go our way. So I want you to be completely relaxed. Go ahead and find yourself. I was in a hotel and I yeah. said, go ahead and uh, find yourself an apartment. We have somebody that works with us. We'll help you find an apartment. So go ahead and do that now. And he and he, he gave me that uh, that license to understand that I was I was part of that roster. And um, I thought it was I thought that transition, which can be very stressful and very difficult, was handled uh extremely well yeah no you look you end up having a four or five year career there and so i and i do think it is fair to say hey we're gonna we're gonna test it before we totally commit and uh, just make sure they know what they're getting but i think what a lot of people don't understand is that in football it's literally when you're when you get signed to what it seems like this big contract or whatever the money is it is literally week to week versus in the uh, nba or major league baseball uh, once you sign, it's a guaranteed contract for that term. And, you know, it is what it is, and it's set up that way, and it's probably one of the reasons why it's the most profitable, but um, it's this no guarantee, so it keeps everybody very motivated uh, to move in the same direction the, with the same goal. So I totally get that. So tell me then, okay, so you're there for a number of years, and now it's time to transition. Did they cut you, or were you traded how did that go in terms of going from Kansas City to uh, the L.A. Raiders? So I went from being uh, uh, worked my way into the starting lineup in Kansas City. And then uh, just as I was, you know, it's kind of uh, finding my way and, and feeling like I've, I've got a handle on this career. I, uh, I broke my wrist badly and uh, it was something that would have required surgery. But they. 
they asked me to continue to play with a cast on and that they would assure me that they would uh, help me with the surgery uh, at the end of the season. Not sure I made the, the, be the best decision to go along with that, but I did. And it was it was challenging to play with a cast, but that's what I did. Two, two games, uh, this is about midway through the season, my, uh, my third, fourth season in the NFL, and then I, uh, then I blew my knee out. So that finished the season. So I had knee surgery and then I still needed to deal with this wrist and I had wrist surgery and I had um, failed wrist surgery actually and which required uh, a complete reconstruction. It was just it was a big deal and I ended up uh, the, 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 the sum total of having these three surgeries in a span of about nine months cost me a season. During that season, um, the Raider, the uh, Chiefs decided to clean house. They fired uh, from the president, the general manager, the head coach, uh, who was uh, getting Frank Gantz at that time. This podcast is brought to you by Laird Superfoods. Let me tell you, these creamers are so amazing. They're super tasty, super delicious. And what they are is whole natural food ingredients mixed into these creamers. And I, I, I'm telling you, when you put this, this stuff into your drink, these powder substance, it is amazing. And their whole tagline is all about fueling your journey. You cannot go and actually power your way up a mountain uh, be in the pool, ride a big wave, uh, unless you're properly fueled, and these guys are doing it all the right way. So where can you find this? At LairdSuperfood.com. And here's the kicker. If you use the, the, the code name MarkP20, that's MarkP20, you're going to get 20% off on your first order. So check it out, LairdSuperfood.com. The general manager, the head coach, uh, who was uh, getting Frank Gantz at that time? I fired everybody, and they cleaned house, and they and they they let me go. Just let me out of my contract. I became an unrestricted free agent, and I hadn't played in uh, almost two years due to the surgeries, and um, and I was uh, signed by the Raiders. So Al, I got a call from Al Davis, his assistant, rather. I was I was living in Los Angeles. Um, because I was doing some acting work and uh, I had a, an actor friend from New York that had encouraged me to pursue acting in the off season. I was having some success living in Los Angeles. The Raiders were in Los Angeles. I wasn't a hot commodity. I was damaged goods due to all of the, the question marks regarding the surgeries I had had. And I got some, some nibbles and interest from um, a half a dozen NFL teams. But then I got a call from Al Davis's assistant and that was a short drive. That was a 15 minute drive to go drive down to the practice facility uh, that the Raiders had in El Segundo, which is just near LAX. And I met with um, Coach Davis and without an agent or anything, we sat down there and just talked about my future, my potential, how I felt physically, how, did what, what he thought I could contribute to the, the Raiders team. And I signed a contract that day, and that was in the off season. That must have been around April. And then, so uh, at that point, I just began working out uh, in the Raiders practice facility, doing my strength training and my yeah. running there, getting to know the guys, and setting myself up to to play the uh, the following season. No, well, that's great. That's a great story. And you know, it's funny because you referenced uh, Al Davis, the owner, as Coach Davis, and. Uh, you know, it, it, it really was that I don't think people who didn't experience that don't understand that he was so uh, he was such a force, a guy that every single day he was at practice. And it, and it really did seem like everything, all all roads went through him. Ultimately, I mean, very, 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 very involved owner all the way down from the top to the bottom of whatever, you know, the guy that was scrubbing the, the uniforms after after practice. And and uh, my my coach, probably possibly your coach, uh, uh, Tom Flores. You know he was great. He was a great X and O guy. But ultimately, it all ran, ran up to Al Davis, and he was just a very powerful figure within the organization, and very hands on in terms of dealing and interacting with a lot of these different players. Sometimes it could be a very positive thing. It sounded like that was the way it was for you. Other times, like with Marcus Allen, where they get in these contractual. Uh, uh, riffs. Uh, it's just, you know, 
he was going to win that thing, and uh, it was not good. But it, you know, he was who he was. I agree. Uh, you know, completely. It, um, I actually was part of the Mike Shanahan, and then he got fired and replaced by Archell. Yeah. Uh, crew of coaches, and uh, but 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 Coach Davis. Um, you know, wasn't till. I, I knew a little bit about Coach Davis, and you know I was very fortunate. So the three owners I played for, uh, Mike Brown, who was one of the founding fathers of the NFL. Mike Brown did things like invented the hustle, the uh, the, the huddle. He invented the playbook. He invented the forty yard dash, which I could tell you the history of if you're interested. And then I played for Lamar Hunt in Kansas City, who was a co-founder of the of the AFL, and then yep. which came the AFC. And then along with with Al Davis, who was the original uh, commissioner of the AFL and forged the merger with Pete Rozelle to the NFL. So three of the great uh, historical people in the history of the NFL were were the, the owners that I played for, Al Davis. And it wasn't until after I finished with the Raiders that I got actually more interested. Some years later, you know, 15 years ago, I, I, I started reading some books about Al Davis, one called uh, Slick. <laughs> some of these are not uh, completely – uh, friendly towards Al Davis, but I, I, I wanted a more in-depth understanding of him and the things that he had accomplished as, um, as a, he was a college football player. He was a college coach. He coached at USC. And then the things that he had done, he's that rare individual that became the owner of an NFL team. Uh, but that wasn't a a, a a wealthy guy. You know, it wasn't a guy that made a fortune in manufacturing or selling cars and, and bought a team. No, he was a guy that earned his shares of the team through sweat equity and being the general manager of the, of the organization and negotiated that that ownership. It's a, it's, a, it's a partnership, the Raiders are, but he and his family and now Mark Davis are the uh, majority owners and the, and the managing general partners. So they have complete say in what goes on it. But he earned all that through his coaching skill, his savvy, his negotiating skill. And he's, he is to your point, a force to be, he was a force to be reckoned with. I think the league still misses him as, as an irritant. And I mean that in a good way. I mean, an irritant in the way that it's the grains of sand inside of a clamshell that, that, that create a pearl. And uh, he was a very special personality. And I, I'm very, um, very honored that the fact that I, that I did spend my, my last year and had a chance to play for Al Davis and the Raiders. Yeah, part of that too for me, um, of course I experienced all the same things as well and uh, I, I can remember, uh, again, tying this back to the University of Washington my head coach was Don James mm -hmm. very disciplined, had tremendous amount of success everything was calculated, there was no loosey-goosey, anything, and now I get drafted by the Raiders and I come down and, and they had just come off the Super Bowl a year or two before and so I, I, I get called to go in the huddle, and, and Plunkett is, is the quarterback, and Clip Branch is the wide receiver, and Marcus Allen, the running back, and all these all-pro guys, Art Shell and others on the, on the line, and then we go ready break, and, and I go out to the uh, to line of scrimmage, and there's Lester Hayes and Howie Long and Lyle Zato and Matt Millen, and uh, you know, just it, it went on and on and on, and and I was just like, okay, I'm, I'm sitting there as 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 or I was standing there waiting for the play to be called, and in those you know three or four seconds as as Plunkett is calling out the signals, I was just thinking in my head, if I ever died and what to heaven, this is what that would be like. I mean, I was literally <laughs> willing to do it for free. Uh, of course, I wasn't, but. It was just a dream come true to be in the sunshine, to be in L.A., to be in Manhattan Beach, El Segundo area, to play with all these fantastic, phenomenal players, to to be with a, a group of people that, that had just come off a Super Bowl. And I'm standing there in uniform in the silver and black. And it was just something, uh, you know, it was a very proud moment for me. But, you know, kind of like you, my, my, my path was always kind of zigzagging and with a lot of uncertainty. And I and I think as as phenomenal as that feeling was to 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 be on that team and be engaged with all those different players, I was just always a, a just a whisker away from being cut, which I was, and brought back, which I was, and cut, which I was, and brought back, which I was, and and traded to New Orleans, you know. And it's just like a it's a it's a it's a it's, a, it's a, an amazing experience, but it, it just pulls on a lot of emotional heartstrings when you're in there because you put your heart and soul into this game that you love so much. And I'm sure it was the same way for you. 
Yeah, you and I had the uh, unique experience. And I tell people this, that I'm looking back. It was stressful at the time, but looking back on it now that I played for three different and and I mean for spans of time, you know, long spans of time. I played for three different organizations where I really got to know the guys on the team, got to know the culture of the organization. That gives me three different you know, reference points to look back on. I was at the uh, Super Bowl week this year in, in Minneapolis and I ran into my old teammate. Really, he was one of my favorite uh, and I've run into him a number of times over the years. He was one of my favorite uh, teammates ever uh, at any level. Anthony Munoz. Yep. And, and he a great player. And he had this. He's a wonderful man. And he and I think I would never you know, say this to him, but I wished for him that he just might have experienced another organization than Cincinnati. I'll contrast that story with I went uh, wasn't this year or last year. I went to the Raiders. The Raiders have a beautiful uh, alumni weekend yep. program. And I was, I, was a, I was up there two years ago. It was, okay. it's, it's amazing. Yeah, amazing. And I and I was talking with uh, another Chiefs. I'm sorry, a Bengals teammate, and that was uh, Max Montoya. Yep. And Max, and we got talking about the days in Cincinnati and talking about, uh, I said, hey, do you stay in touch with Anthony? Oh, yeah, of course. And um, and I said, let me ask you something. In between the uh, the raid, the the raid, uh, in between the raid, by the time you got to the Raiders, I said, you know, Max, you came straight from Cincinnati. I, I also took four seasons in in. Uh, Kansas City, which I loved. But let me ask you something. When you got to the Raiders, did you not? What did you think? Because I'll just speak for myself. I, I just I just thought it was now. I the, the Kansas City is such an amazing organization. Their facilities are phenomenal. So the Raiders, I just it, the, they, the facilities weren't as nice, but I really enjoyed the culture and the guys on that team. And he said the same thing. I said, it wasn't it? Correct me if I'm wrong, but how you know when you got traded to the Raiders, it didn't take you long to figure out that it was kind of special and it was a it was a great opportunity for you to see something different at the end of your career than you had experienced in Cincinnati. And he said, Pete, you, need, you hit the nail on the head. And I'm so gl- gr- glad that I finished with the Raiders. And then he look look, Pete, we're, we're standing here talking at the at the Raiders alumni weekend. This is something that the Cincinnati Bengals don't do. They do not do this. They, we're talk, the, the Kansas City Chiefs do something similar, but not nearly up to the standard that the Raiders uh, have the the, the 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 standard that the Raiders have set. So it's uh, so the the Raiders. My point is that they the Raiders were an, were an exceptional organization as a culture, not necessarily necessarily as a facility, because they they've never had uh, uh, a first rate facility to play their games in sadly enough however as a culture they have been outstanding for a long long time and as an organization and it's within its position of how they deal with their uh, alumni they're extraordinary no uh, they're amazing i was up there two years ago with burline and and steve wright and mike dial and some of these other guys i'm sure you know so just a great experience i'll be up there again this next year i couldn't do this year but uh it was so much fun to to bump into all these different characters, Jerry Robinson and others that I played with, and and um, you know, again, they just make you feel whether you are an all pro or just a couple year guy, like you're part of the family, which you are. So it's just a it's a great thing that I can hang my hat on, that you can hang your hat on for the rest of our lives. So let's make a little shift here. So you talked about um, transitioning, like we all have to do from playing in the NFL. Your career is now done. And uh, now you have to move on to other things. And, and you know, I'm looking down at this this list of of uh, television and, and movie credits that you have, Heartbreak Ridge, Heat, Johnny Be Good, um, all kinds of TV shows, uh, Nash Bridges, Silk Stockings, some other stuff. And so for a lot of people, and I'm one of them too, um, the transition from when you get done playing is driving off that cliff. You know, now I'm 29, 30 years old, and I'm like, okay, what am I going to do right now? And I think the NFLPA, as you are aware, have done a fantastic job of really picking up their game and and providing all kinds of programs to really help these guys like you and I transition from A to B. But what was that like for you? And did you have the plan? I was was your plan? Okay, for sure, I'm 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 going into the acting world. 
Um, or were you just like you winged it and you're going to try to figure it out? Yeah, you know, it was going into the acting world because I had a little bit of a running start into that. And yet it, it remains, you know, to this day, all these years later, you know, a, 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 an amorphous thing, a diff- difficult to get your hands around it. I'm still working at that. But my my day job uh, has always been a, a challenge due to if you there, there's no you can't split the baby if you want to be an actor. And, and this is this is advice for anybody out there who thinks they might want to get into that acting, modeling, entertainment world. Uh, in front of the camera, I, I want to be clear, is that you need to be available. There's no such thing as as having a regular sort of nine to five job and then just going ahead and to your, your auditions. It just will never work that way. You need to be all in and available at a moment's notice to get to auditions and then to work. Your the idea is to work, and then if somebody says, "Hey, you're going to be on this," uh, you booked uh, a guest spot on this TV show. And we need you for the next seven days. Uh, you, you get, and it starts tomorrow. You know, you got to be able to go and work and do that. So, I knew that it was what I wanted to do. So, the idea of my of of having another job to support me because. You know, me and you played before you made that big money, right? So you were just maybe had a little bit of money set away, and, and I know that was the case for me. It wasn't much. So I needed an, uh, a regular income, and for me it was physical fitness. And it was pa- – I was that guy going all the way back to high school and then uh, my days at the University of Maryland that when I had a, a, a free minute, I was hanging around with the strength and conditioning coach. I was always curious. I'm like, hey, how come you have us doing power cleans? And why is it that you say that the stronger we get, if we're strong in our squat exercise, that we'll be faster? How does that work? And then he would say, oh, this thing called this motor units and muscle fiber recruitment patterns and all this. I was fascinated by it. And I was also fascinated by – I was a skinny kid and I was fascinated by bodybuilding and that's what transformed my life. I was literally the skinny kid in the basement with the with the cement weight set, if you know what that means, reading bodybuilder magazines and eating crappy tasting protein powder in the 70s. That was actually me <laughs> and I loved all of it. And I loved it even right before Arnold Schwarzenegger was my original bodybuilding hero, Dave Draper, the blonde bomber from Northern California, who I I had a chance to meet. uh, And I also had a chance to meet Joe Weider, the guy that published all the great bodybuilding magazines years later when I moved to to Los Angeles. I loved it. And I thank them for their inspiration. So when I got older, I wanted to, you know, increase my formal education on how I could help people as a trainer and a strength coach and a fitness expert. And that's what I am now. That's what I have been. And that's always been my day job and something I'm passionate about. And I continue on that path these days, um, sharpening my own blade because I, you know, I always say, I always advise people say, what, what should I look for when I'm hiring a personal trainer? I say, make sure first and foremost, before you even concern yourself with their academics, do they have a physique that you admire and respect? Very important. So uh, I continue to, I, I hope, lead from the front in this area of my life. I continue the path as an actor. I've got a film coming out in, uh, in three weeks. Uh, a film called Rusty Tulak that I'm very, very proud of that'll uh, be available for people in movie theaters here in Los Angeles and then on uh, um, uh, uh, various outlets beyond that. And uh, that challenges the other part of my brain. Nothing has been particularly easy for me, but it never was, right? For guys like me and you, that whole idea, some people have this odd notion, right, that if you played in the NFL, it was really like smooth, like, I don't know, maybe it is for a few of the guys that had absurd talent and things just really went their way. Um, but for most of us, it was a, a hustle, a struggle, uh, ups and downs, depression and joy all in the span of the same day. And then, you know, repeat that. That was my experience. It was filled with a lot of anxiety. 
So later in life, you know, you you kind of fall into the more of a normalized pattern of getting through life. But I don't think the fact that missing the camaraderie in the locker room and missing the opportunity to uh, compete at the highest level on Sunday afternoons, I don't think that ever goes away completely. But I can live with that because I um, had a chance to experience it. Well, I think that 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 goes for anybody, right? I mean, it. it I, I kept trying to figure out for me, like, how do I replace this feeling of catching, you know, the winning touchdown or the crowds and all that kind of stuff? And the answer is it doesn't. I mean, you can't replicate that feeling, and and that's okay. You just have to get to that point of like, hey, at least I was able to to experience that. And for people who don't know, like, I've actually seen. I, I've I've seen some videos on you, and and obviously we we've become Facebook f- friends, and we've got a lot of common pals in in in, in common, and and uh, you to me look like a combination between Hulk Hogan and you know, like a like a, like a, a a better slimmed down version of Hulk Hogan and Moses who just came off the the, the peaks <laughs> of Sinai, and you know you've got this great vibe about you, and and I, and I do agree, and I, this is just Mark's pet peeve, but it drives me berserk to go into these gyms and having, you know, watching other trainers um, who aren't in shape train people, and then they're talking about their cat and what happened on the weekend and the boyfriend's or girlfriend's <laughs> problems. And it's just like, that is just not what it's about. And, I, you know, it shouldn't bother me because it's, it, you know, who cares, really? I mean, it's not bothering I mean, it's it's bothering me, but I'm not interacting <laughs> with them, right? But yeah. it's just one of those things where, you know, I, I, I'm now climbing mountains around the world, and, and not only do I want to feel the part, look the part, but I have to be the part because that's, you know, to feel myself and go up these these different crazy mountains, you know, you got to put yourself in that position. And for you to be that, that shiny example of what it's like to, to you know, get ripped out and, and be the best that you can be, I mean, if you're not willing to put the work in and put your head down and have the NFL mentality, then, you know, what's the point? What's the point of paying you whatever you – you charge, you know, for these people to come in and 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 have those types of goals. It just doesn't make sense to me. So I, I am completely aligned with the way that you, you with you you train, and, and it's it's really cool that you've been able to make this into a business. And it sounds like you've trained some celebs and and other people like that. And and now uh, on top of that, you're transitioning into the corporate speaking world, all about health and fitness. And it sounds like that's taken off. Yeah, no, I appreciate you you mentioning that, Mark. So I was a uh, I've done um, some corporate speaking on the subject of wellness over the years, and I've gotten um, such a positive response from it. I, I I didn't really think that that was something I could do uh, and really integrate that into my schedule, but I, I think I can. I'm beginning to do that. And I, I've got representation now, uh, uh, a company named Speaker Buzz that's uh, got to spell it right, speakerbuzz.com, speaker hyphen buzz speaker dash buzz.com but anyway that's where folks can find me and i am passionate about talking to folks about physical fitness and wellness and here's why the most obvious thought that jumps into people's heads when you say look and i'm 56 years old and say i'm going to stand in front of and get in front of a room and there's going to be a bunch of corporate people and most of them are up senior management and this kind of thing. So I don't know, 30s, 40s, 50s, and their 60s. And I'm going to talk to them about physical fit. And the first thing that might jump into your head would say, well, he's probably, you know, with 71% of the population overweight, and that's a fact that, that Pete's going to talk to me about how I can um, maybe get my, my belly slimmer or get, you know, get some of this body fat off of my body. But here's the main reason I want to talk to po- to folks, especially in the corporate setting. It's it's two, and it's it's a two, it runs on two rails, one no greater than the other. But I want you to be happier, and I want you to be more productive. I want you to feel better, and I want you to be more productive in what it is that you do. And I don't mean just what you're punching the clock to do over there at Caterpillar or Apple or IBM. I'm I'm not. That's good. That's a good thing. Everybody wants more productive people, but I mean more productive in your life. I mean with your children. I mean with your spouse. I mean with your friends. Be more productive. Feel better. Have more energy to have a better quality of life with them. And that's achievable through diet and exercise. 
It's crazy, but it's true. And the, it, it amounts to the quality and, and the programming of the exercise that you engage in, of course, the frequency, the totality of that program. And secondly, the food that fuels it. So we're going to tune up the motor, but we got to put the right fuel in there, too. So I talk to people about that and I tell them that I can say with certainty and passion and experience that through diet and exercise. And by the way, I'm not a complicated man. I take these, I, my, one of the things I'm very good at is taking complex idea and refining them down to very simple, presentable, digestible ideas. I, I don't want to make physical fitness and, you know, you've got 206 bones and 646 skeletal muscles and you've got these nerve endings and these different kinds of muscle fibers, all that gobbledygook. I, trust me, I know about it, but I can, what I can do is help you and inspire you, I hope, to find a way to find your physical fitness, to improve the, the, the function of your heart and lungs, to improve the way the hormones are reacting in your body, the good hormones, more of them making you feel better, more testosterone with the guys and gals, by the way, and less of the, the hormones that are, that are deleterious, putting together a program that's easy. To, to easy to engage in, not easy to be accomplished necessarily because you're gonna, it's going to be effortful, but through the right exercise program design, you will feel better. Couple that with the power of, of nutrition. And a lot of times people want to, want to leapfrog over food and talk about what's the best supplement, you know, what's the best supplement for me to lose fat or to gain muscle. Look, the, the answer is food whole foods, natural foods. So I discuss this with people, pull them back into, you know, into the, the, the zone of doing things holistically and say, I can help you. And hopefully someplace along this way, motivate you, remove the stigma that will be complex and difficult to accomplish. But trust that we can take the population, 71% of them overweight, and don't feel very good, right? Don't feel so energized. Their love life uh, very likely isn't in quite uh, to the standard that they'd hoped it would be at this point in their life. All of these things that people every single day, good, well-intended people are feeling, and we can help and fix that. And then on top of it, additionally, speaking in the corporate structure, make these same folks, guess what? They'll be happier and more productive. Yeah, look, look, I, I literally view uh, feeding my mind – um, with exercising. So if I, mm. you know, like literally I, 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 it's almost like breathing to me. So it's, it's just absolutely impossible for me to wake up every single morning, like I did this morning and go work out, which I do. And it's just, you know, I get up and I brush my teeth and I, yeah, I put my gym stuff on and out the door and it's just a great way to get your, you know, the muscles, the brain. And, and I, a lot of it, I call it feet on floor. And the hardest part about getting up, especially in the morning, is putting those feet on floor, uh, uh, putting on your shoes, going out the door. I mean, that's the hardest. If you can get through that and you're, you're well on your way to the gym, if that's where you're going, then that's, you know, you, you've got like 51% of the, of the task complete. Now just get your butt to the, to the gym, make it happen, and you come back, you're all charged up, and and like you said, it feeds on all these other parts of your 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 whole life. You know, your relationships, mm -hmm. the way you interact with other things going on in your life, um, your business, all that stuff. And it's it's just you know, I mean, it sounds like we are are cut from the same cloth, and and it, it's just like all the benefits have come along, especially when I've gone through a lot of stress and I've had my share. It's really helped me just to process all that stress and to put it in perspective. And I've done a lot of problem solving, you know, jogging or mountain biking or whatever, when I'm just out there thinking on my own about, you know, how am I going to go over this certain thing? And, and it's just been the magic formula for me versus just popping a pill or something and being reliant on those other things that don't take you in the right positive direction. So look, I'm, you're preaching to the choir. I'm glad you're doing this. And, uh, the big question for you is where can people find you so that they can tap into some of these things that you're doing? You know, I'm easy to find. Uh, Pete Koch, P-E-T-E-K-O-C-H. I'm the only one out there, really. And you can find me on uh, Instagram, 
Facebook and LinkedIn and uh, extending my market to uh, and, and to, to LinkedIn has been great because I love that business community. But I'm also love the, the social media part of of Instagram and Facebook. And if you do care to look at it, you will notice that about five times a week I will post a video across all those three platforms and I call it making you better 30 seconds at a time and about a year and a half ago it dawned on me and I, I was I was pondering a quote by Einstein he says try not to be a man of wealth but rather a man of value not so much a man of wealth but aspire to be a man of value and I was thinking I've got so much knowledge and passion when it comes to areas of physical fitness. And I'm not a kid anymore. It's one thing if the messaging is coming from somebody who's 26, but I'm 56 and I want to help. And I feel like I can be, I know I can be of value to people and I don't even need your money to do it. So I decided that I could offer tips to people in areas of also all, all across the board of physical fitness, everything from strength training to stretching to cardiovascular training. And I could offer it. And it's funny because on Instagram, you're only allowed to post for uh, 60 seconds of video. That's that's the way it works. It just cuts you off after 60 seconds. And I knew this. So I said to I was talking to my training partner and I and I said, uh, I'm going to call this. Maybe I'll call this making you uh, I'm helping you 60 seconds at a time. And that sort of evolved into it. And I, it's funny. I said to myself, who's got 60 seconds anymore? Right. So I said, um, I'll call it 30 seconds. I'm fudging it a little bit. But I, then I said, you know what? Rather than calling it helping you. How about this? I'm going to cut straight to the chase. I'm going to help you. I'm going to make you check that making you better 30 seconds at a time. So across all my social media platforms. About five times a week, you can get information from me absolutely free. And if any of it helps you, I wish you would like it and leave a comment. And if some of it truly resonates with you, I can help people through their programming, nutrition and exercise through my online training program. That's how I can reach a larger audience that don't just live here in Los, the west side of Los Angeles. But that's that's my hope. And then on a corporate level. If my messaging resonates with you, then then um, I'm available to come and talk to your group or organization. And, you know, Mark, I, I just want to go back and say you and I, as part of the, the great gift, we worked our tails off. But the great gift of the opportunity to play in the National Football League, we were not only surrounded by uh, many, many superb positional coaches and, and, and organizational people, but also the strength and conditioning coaches and the trainers. And I know I can just tell just talking with you, you were soaking that in as I were. And I thought I got had one of the great opportunities in a lifetime. I've continued my education in physical fitness, and this is my opportunity to share that with the world. The NFL is a unique platform. You and I were a part of it, and this is my chance to give back. Yeah, that's awesome. So look at, you quoted a great philosopher uh, a minute ago. I'm going to quote another one. That is Pete Koch uh, speaking here on the pod today. Rule number one, you can do it. Rule number two, it requires sacrifice. And rule number three, you can do it. Pete, I really appreciate it. You're awesome. Inspiration to all and uh, just love following your journey. And, and I'm going to do that uh, on Instagram and have those 60 second moments of, of reflection and inspiration that you can bring to the world. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, Mark, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Hey, and thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Summit podcast. We are so glad to have you along for this journey. And if you enjoy the show, please tell a friend, share it on iTunes, spread it to the planet. We're looking to broadcast this to every person that is out there because, as you know, everybody has their own summit that they're going after. Okay, if you're looking to follow my journey, you can find that through my social links on markpattisonnfl.com. That's Mark, M-A-R-K, Pattison, P-A-T-T-I-S-O-N, NFL.com. So... Until the next podcast, just remember, clear eyes, full hearts, and remember, it takes a little more to make a champion, so make it happen. Thank you. Bye.